What you're looking at is the famous saguaro cactus. These remarkable 40-foot giants have survived in one of North America's harshest environments for over 10,000 years. But now, these iconic desert monuments are facing an existential threat. The saguaro cactus is dying faster than it can reproduce, and when these giants disappear, it will have devastating consequences. These are a keystone species of the Sonoran Desert, and without them, we're about to see a cascading collapse that could wipe out the entire ecosystem. Migration routes, pollination networks, and entire species all hinge on the survival of this single cactus. Today, I'm going to show you the five threats that are killing America's most iconic desert plant and why losing the saguaro means total disaster for this remarkable ecosystem. But before we talk about what's killing them, you need to understand what makes the saguaro so irreplaceable. Because once you see how connected this one plant is to everything around it, you'll understand why its disappearance would trigger a cascade collapse across millions of acres. The saguaro cactus exists in only one place on the planet, the Sonoran Desert, stretching across southern Arizona, southeastern California, and northwestern Mexico. This makes them one of the most geographically restricted plants on Earth. Think about that for a second. These towering giants that define the American Southwest exist in an area smaller than most states. But here's what makes these plants so extraordinary. A saguaro can live for 200 years, but it grows at an almost impossibly slow pace. In their first decade of life, they might reach just one and a half inches tall, and it then takes a further 40 to 60 years before they grow their first arm. That means a saguaro that sprouted when your grandparents were born is just now reaching reproductive maturity. Those iconic arms that make saguaros instantly recognizable are a sign of old age. By the time a saguaro looks like the classic desert postcard, it's already a senior citizen in plant terms, potentially older than anyone watching this video. But here's what is remarkable about these plants. During their lifetime, a mature saguaro can store up to 200 gallons of water in its tissues, making it a vital water source during drought. Their trunks and arms provide nesting sites for many different species. Gila woodpeckers carve out cavities in the saguaro's flesh. When they move on, elf owls move in. Bats pollinate their massive white flowers. Doves and other birds feast on their ruby red fruit. The saguaro isn't just a plant. It's an entire apartment complex for desert life but their reproduction process reveals just how precarious their survival really is. A single saguaro can produce 40 million seeds, one of which may survive to become an adult. That's a 0.000025% success rate. For context, you're more likely to win the lottery than a saguaro seed is to reach maturity. So why such terrible odds? Well, a big part of this is due to the fact that saguaro seedlings are incredibly vulnerable to the climate. Unlike the drought-resistant adults, young saguaros need nurse plants to survive their first decade. Picture a seedling no thicker than a toothpick, sprouting in soil that can reach 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Without the shade of a mesquite tree or palo verde, it would be baked alive in weeks. With some shade, it might survive, but only if the rains come. The odds of these plants reaching maturity are highly unlikely, and this creates a dependency that makes saguaros extremely vulnerable to ecosystem disruption. Remove the nurse plants, and saguaro reproduction collapses, or disrupt the rainfall patterns that keep those nurse plants alive, and the whole system breaks down. But the saguaro's relationship with its environment goes much deeper than that. Many of the 60-plus species that depend on saguaros have a symbiotic relationship. The bats that pollinate saguaro flowers travel hundreds of miles following the blooming cycle. The birds that nest in saguaro cavities also disperse seeds to new locations. You see, the towering giants aren't just symbols of the desert. They're the foundation that holds the entire Sonoran ecosystem together. Understanding how one seemingly simple plant can hold up an entire ecosystem teaches us something crucial about our own world. Everything is more connected than we think. And when we understand those connections, we understand what we stand to lose. One plant, 60 plus species, entire pollination networks, migration routes, food chains, all dependent on a cactus that takes 150 years to grow. Right now, there are over 2 million cacti in the Saguaro National Park, with the latest count representing a roughly 7% increase from the 2010 census. But what those numbers don't tell you is that in recent years there have been record low numbers of new plants growing, the fewest since they started decadal surveys in 1964. So what's changed? Why is the Saguaro cacti's reproduction now dropping so drastically? Well, the reason for this is likely due to multiple factors. The first is that the changing desert climate is pushing temperatures beyond what even these heat-adapted specialists can handle. 
But the problem here isn't the daytime temperatures, but rather the nighttime ones. Saguaros, like all plants, need to cool down. They use the cooler nighttime hours to recover from the day's heat stress, open their pores, and take in carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. But nighttime temperatures in the Sonoran Desert are staying dangerously high. When nighttime temperatures don't drop below 90 degrees Fahrenheit, saguaros can't complete their recovery cycle. They're essentially running a fever that never breaks. And over the course of weeks and months, this chronic heat stress begins breaking down their cellular structure. Saguaro stems become thinner as the plant struggles to maintain water pressure. The distinctive ribs that give saguaros their accordion-like structure narrow and deepen. Branches and stems weaken under the constant stress. Eventually, they collapse under their own weight. A 40-foot saguaro that has stood for 150 years that survived droughts, fires, and desert storms will simply topple over one day. Not in a dramatic crash, but in a slow, inevitable failure. Its internal structure will become too damaged to support its massive frame. But the heat stress is compounded by something even more devastating, a 30-year drought that shows no signs of ending. The Sonoran Desert has always been dry, but what we're seeing now is unprecedented. Annual precipitation has dropped significantly across the region, and when rain does come, it arrives in more intense bursts followed by longer dry periods. But while adults can tap their massive water reserves, those vulnerable seedlings are dying in the hotter, drier soils or being washed away in floodwaters before they can establish deep root systems. And this survival crisis is already visible in the data. Suaro establishment surged during the high precipitation and cool periods between 1960 and 1990. When scientists measure drought conditions using the Palmer Drought Severity Index, they found that few saguaro seedlings survive when conditions drop below negative two on the scale. Right now, we're currently experiencing conditions far below that threshold, and they're persisting for years at a time. Climate models show that this isn't temporary. The combination of rising temperatures and altered precipitation patterns is pushing the Sonoran Desert beyond the climatic conditions that saguaros have experienced for the past 10,000 years. The western populations near the coast are getting hit hardest, experiencing more severe drought impacts than inland populations. But even the most resilient saguaro populations are projected to decline by 2099. But the warming desert isn't the only threat transforming the Sonoran Desert. Heat stress and drought are also creating the perfect conditions for a second threat, one that's even harder to reverse. Grassification is turning this biodiverse ecosystem into something completely alien to the place. Invasive grasses, particularly buffalo grass, are spreading across the desert floor at an exponential rate. These grasses were originally introduced for cattle forage and erosion control, brought in from Mediterranean and Sub-Saharan African regions with similar arid conditions. But these invasive grasses have changed the fire dynamics of the desert. Historically, native desert plants have been spaced apart, with bare ground between them, and this natural spacing has prevented fires from spreading. But invasive grasses create continuous fuel loads. They fill in those gaps between native plants, creating highways for fire to travel across previously fire-resistant landscapes. And saguaros have zero tolerance for fire. Unlike many other desert plants that can re-sprout after burning, saguaros rarely survive even low-intensity fires. When they burn, they die. One of the worst cases happened in 2020. El Nino conditions drove substantial winter rainfall, which fueled the explosive growth of invasive grasses. But when dry conditions returned, those grasses became perfect tinder. The telegraph and bush fires burned hundreds of thousands of acres. The flames killed vast numbers of saguaros across the valley. Most of the saguaros that died in those 2020 fires are being replaced by non-native grassland, not regenerating the precious saguaro populations. And this creates a vicious cycle. As saguaros disappear, the desert loses its nesting cavities, its water storage, its food sources, and its shelter networks. The diverse desert scrub that supported hundreds of species gets replaced by homogeneous invasive grassland. Scientists are calling this transformation a regime change, and once this transition happens, it's extremely difficult to reverse. The invasive grasses outcompete native plants for water and nutrients. They change soil chemistry and create conditions that favor more grass growth over native desert vegetation. And while rising temperatures and invasive species attack saguaros from the natural world, humans are only adding additional stress to this delicate desert ecosystem. Urban expansion across Arizona is fragmenting critical saguaro habitat at an unprecedented rate. As cities like Phoenix and Tucson sprawl outward, they're bulldozing the nurse plants that saguaro seedlings depend on for survival. When developers clear land for housing subdivisions, shopping centers, and golf courses, they're destroying the reproductive infrastructure that allows new saguaros to establish. This habitat fragmentation 
creates isolated islands of saguaro populations that can't exchange genes or support the complex pollinator networks that keep the species viable. The bats that travel hundreds of miles following saguaro blooms suddenly find gaps in their flight paths where the desert once connected different populations. But fragmentation is just the indirect way humans are destroying saguaros. There's a far more direct threat, one that's so profitable and so widespread that the National Park Service had to resort to technology usually reserved for tracking endangered animals in an attempt to prevent it. And that threat is theft. The illegal saguaro trade operates like a black market for living monuments. A mature saguaro can fetch up to $100 per foot on the illegal market. And a 20-foot specimen? That's $2,000 for a single plant. Poachers use chainsaws to cut saguaros at ground level, after which a plant gets transported to buyers who want instant desert landscaping without waiting a century for nature to do the work. They want the aesthetic without the patience, the symbol without the sacrifice. And in doing so, they're eliminating a living being that cannot be replaced in any human lifetime. And even if the saguaro survives the initial cutting and transport, transplanted adults rarely establish successfully in new locations. Arizona's native plant law makes it illegal to harm or remove saguaros without a permit, regardless of whether they're on public or private land. Violations can result in fines up to $5,000 for cactus and even felony charges for large-scale theft operations. But the challenge for law enforcement is that the Sonoran Desert covers thousands of square miles and poachers often target remote areas where they're unlikely to be caught. By the time stolen saguaros appear in the commercial trade, they're often hundreds of miles from where they were originally taken. This situation became so severe that the National Park Service resorted to microchipping thousands of saguaros in protected areas. These tiny electronic tags help authorities track stolen cacti when they show up in nurseries or private collections. Each chip contains a unique identifier that can be read with a scanner, allowing authorities to definitively prove when a saguaro has been stolen from protected lands. The combination of development pressure, habitat fragmentation, and illegal harvesting creates a perfect storm of human-caused threats that operate on much faster timescales than the natural processes that created saguaro populations in the first place. But here's where the story changes, because while the threats are real and urgent, so is the response. Scientists and conservation organizations are fighting back with some of the most innovative restoration approaches ever attempted in desert ecosystems. Scientists have identified which saguaro populations will survive these new pressures, and they're using genetic rescue to prepare the species for a hotter future. And they're using these plants to attempt something that's never been done before in desert restoration, large-scale saguaro replanting. The first step of this ambitious plan is counterintuitive. Instead of trying to save all saguaros equally, researchers identified which populations are most likely to survive climate change. They found saguaro populations thriving in the hottest, driest parts of the Sonoran Desert, like those near Kofa National Wildlife Refuge, which receives less than half the average rainfall of Phoenix. These populations have developed unique genetic makeups that help them survive extreme conditions. And this discovery changed everything. It meant scientists could focus their efforts on the most promising genetics, essentially fast-tracking evolution to prepare saguaros for a hotter future. With resilient genetics identified, the National Forest Foundation and partners established dedicated cacti and saguaro nurseries on the Tonto National Forest to scale up production. Conservation teams cultivate seedlings from these resilient populations growing them until they develop protective spines at about two years of age, making them hardy enough to withstand minor freezes and initial transplant shock. With seedlings ready, the work moves to the field. Community groups prepare the land to recreate the natural conditions saguaro seedlings need, placing young cacti near nurse trees like ironwood, mesquite, and palo verde to maximize survival chances. And in March 2025, this strategy came to life when volunteers planted 130 young saguaros in a single day. But planting seedlings means nothing if the ecosystem around them collapses. So conservation teams are actively treating buffalo grass and other invasive plants on the Coronado National Forest to prevent further conversion of native desert into fire-prone grasslands. Meanwhile, others are building the infrastructure needed for long-term survival. The Desert Botanical Garden launched Saguaro Initiatives, a series of community science projects that engage volunteers in documenting and protecting local saguaro populations. Scientists have collected DNA samples from saguaros across their entire natural range, from southern Sonora to northern Arizona, building a genetic library that could prove crucial for future restoration efforts. Perhaps most innovatively, Tucson Audubon held an international contest to design nest boxes that mimic natural saguaro cavities. The winning prototypes are being tested to determine which designs birds prefer. 
with the goal of providing nesting sites in areas where mature saguaros have been lost to fire or development. This research reveals a crucial insight. You can't save the saguaro in isolation. You must save the ecosystem around it. That's why these efforts work together. Genetic rescue prepares the saguaro, nursery scale production, strategic planting gets it in the ground, ecosystem protection ensures it thrives, and data-driven mapping optimizes where efforts matter most. It's not a single solution. It's an integrated system approach to conservation. The saguaro's decline represents more than losing an iconic plant. When these keystone species disappear, the cascade effects ripple across hundreds of miles. Desert bat migration routes collapse as flower corridors disappear. Cavity nesting birds lose their homes as mature saguaros die. Seed dispersal networks break down. The Sonoran Desert transforms from a biodiverse ecosystem into fire-prone grassland that can't support the species that evolved here over millions of years. This isn't just a regional crisis. Dryland ecosystems like the Sonoran Desert cover more than 40% of Earth's land surface and support over 2 billion people. The saguaro's fate will test whether humanity can adapt quickly enough to save Earth's remaining wild places before they cross irreversible tipping points. If you want to hear another remarkable conservation story, then make sure to check out this video we covered on the Wollomi Pine, a species that was brought back from the brink of extinction with one of the most ambitious conservation strategies ever attempted.